Hello everyone, welcome to the special bonus episode of Lex Files, coming to you from my brand new office in the house we just moved into. And it's nice because oftentimes my three-year-old is here playing at my feet and doing art at her art station, and the baby is getting used to the place. And so this will be a nice location for bringing you the third season of Lex Files. For today, this special bonus episode is a lecture that I gave at the UK Psychedelic Society a few months ago. And as you might know, I've been working on this long graphic novel series about using Moby Dick to explain the endocannabinoid system. And you can see three of those graphic novels on my site at lexpelger.com. This lecture is basically a legend for those books. It is the correspondences about how all of this works, how you can treat a neuron like a giant underwater city, and how nandamide can be our great white whale. And so today's lecture is trying to summarize some of those ideas about how the endocannabinoid system is so important to general human health, the physiology about how cells work, and especially to neurochemistry and the immune system. So hopefully you find it as fun, as fascinating as I do, because it's about 10 years work coming at you right now. So thanks and enjoy. Cannabis truly is a pharmacy and a flower. Survival comes with cooperation. Pleasure is healing. You're being a warrior of the weird. I'm Lex Pelger, Director of Education at CV Sciences, and this is The Lex Files. Thanks for joining us today. So my name's Lex Pelger. I write books about the endocannabinoid system based on Moby Dick, and you can see three of them right now at lexpelger.com. My background is in biochemistry, and as Martha said, I have a podcast called The Lex Files. Uh, the focus is mostly on drugs and spirituality and health. Today, I have two goals. In the first half, I want to teach just about four things about the endocannabinoid system. And there's a yin and yang to all of them, so hopefully that will help us understand. The endocannabinoid system is the endogenous cannabinoid system. It turns out that we all have cannabinoids inside of us, and that's only been known for about 25 years now, but it turns out to be an incredibly important signaling system. Just like the morphine molecule from the opium plant, introduced us to our own endorphins. Endorphins means endogenous morphine. So the cannabinoids from the cannabis plant helped us discover our own endocannabinoids, this important signaling molecules. The first half, I just want to explain anandamide and 2-AG, which are the first two neurotransmitters that were discovered, and as well as CB1 and CB2, the two main receptors that are well-known and well-studied. Those are the four that I'd really like to teach and for you to know and be able to share with other people. So that, after we go over those, that's when we'll take a quick bio break, as well as maybe five minutes for questions. Then for the second half, I want to explain how many different systems are involved and infected by the, affected by the endocannabinoid system. For that half is not about memorizing every detail. It's more like letting the waves wash over you like scrolls of silver. The main point is that the endocannabinoid system is one of the biggest discoveries in human health in the last few decades but it's still suffering from a myopia to its true importance and still not studied and taught enough in med schools, for instance. And the most important point to take away for your friends and family, especially the older people in your life, is that harnessing the endocannabinoid system for health could be a very big deal for people. You'll hear me use uh, neurodegenerative diseases a lot and mention them a lot. That is the number one. If you know anybody suffering with a neurodegenerative disorder, Parkinson's, MS, ALS, the list goes on. Cannabinoids are absolutely something you should, uh, they should be trying. They protect the brain in so many ways. But it seems like all of these different diseases of aging specifically, there's data to show the cannabinoids helping. And Unfortunately, it's not often giant clinical studies. It's more like small clinical studies, and there's not enough money to do the giant ones. But as you'll see, the underlying biochemistry makes it clear that these small clinical studies and all the stories that you're hearing from friends and family are true. There's really something deep going on here. So first, let's out, lay out the three main sources of cannabinoids on the planet. So in the center, you have the phytocannabinoids. These are the ones from the plant. You probably know CBD, you probably know CBG, THC, the one that gets you high, Delta-9 THC. There's about 140 cannabinoids from the plant that have been discovered so far. There's also maybe half a dozen or a dozen other plants that also make cannabinoids, but it's at pretty low levels. Basically, in the plant kingdom, cannabis is what makes the cannabinoids. But the big discovery was on the left, the endocannabinoids. It turns out that we make these as well. And... 
the interesting thing in evolutionary history is the endocannabinoids far predate the phytocannabinoids, the ones from the plants, because any creature with a spinal cord has endocannabinoids. So it's not just us, it's all mammals and most of the other branches of life as well. So there are sea sponges that have endocannabinoid system. That's how far back in history it goes. The main group that you know that doesn't is insects. That means the, the phytocannabinoids, the cannabis plant probably evolved sometime in the age of the dinosaurs. It's hard to know, but that's probably about it. And the endocannabinoids must have evolved far, far earlier than that. So the cannabinoids were first found in, in mammals and, and small creatures like that before the plant ever started producing it. And then the last source of cannabinoids is the synthetic ones that we've started making in laboratories. Now we move on to the metaphor, the Moby Dick part that uh, makes it sell. The cellular city, that's what we're going to be playing with the entire time tonight. And it's not a new metaphor at all. Uh, even when Carl Sagan in Cosmos episode four, I think he opened up with New York City being like a single cell. We won't use New York. This is a UK psychedelic study. We'll focus on London, but it's a great metaphor for what's going on here because a cell is so complex. It's more complex than any one mind can really wrap its head around. Just like London is more complex than any one uh, mind can wrap its head around. You have all of these parts working together. And we're going to go over some of these, these vital parts, but think of a cell like a city. This is the hapax legimen of the, this is the giant thing that is supposed to, uh, uh, you're not supposed to get, you're supposed to, to, to look at the complexity. This is some of the main metabolic pathways used by any cell. These are very basic to anything that's living. And this looks a lot like how a city would be organized. There's all of these pressures back and forth of molecules, passing on their energy, passing on their messages, all trying to work together to take care of themselves and to keep the city going. The thing is, when you're in London, at least you can see the people. When you're studying cells, you can't see them. You can only see their effects oftentimes. The molecules are too small for a light microscope. So imagine trying to figure out how the dogs are getting walked in London if the dog walkers were invisible to you. All you have is inference. All you have is all these ways to tease out what's happening here. And that's biochemistry. That's part of what makes it so much fun. Uh, there's always discoveries uh, lurking around. It's easy for any undergrad to be like, well, how does this even happen? And the professor will say, well, I don't know. Maybe you'll be the one to figure it out. In physics, you need hundreds of people and giant machines. So I like biochemistry. It's more democratic. So picture the cell like a city like this beautiful, giant, complex city in front of you. There's a city government that keeps everything running. There's the power station for energy. There's the nutrition systems to deliver food to all of the inhabitants. There's the city walls to keep out invaders like Julius Caesar or Bodacia, the Celtic queen. You thought because I was a Yank, I wouldn't do my history homework. There's intricate recycling systems and manufacturing facilities for city upkeep and a city is a delicate web upheld by its physical infrastructure as well as the will of its 9 million inhabitants. And oftentimes they have contrary ideas about what needs to happen in a city. And things generally go in the right direction, but it's never pretty and it's never perfect, just like the human body, just like a city, just like a cell. There's all these contrasting balances and, never, and nothing ever works out just exactly the right way, but it's good enough to keep going. That's why I really love the idea of treating the web of ocean life like the, the web of molecules that are interacting with a cell. And so the reason I chose Moby Dick actually is a little bit of hubris. And you have to, I think it's, it's only right to start with the pride that goeth before the fall. This was a number of years ago. I, well, my daughter's three. So this was 10 years ago now. And I've been writing about drugs for a long time. And I thought I was a hotshot young science writer. You know, I, I knew drugs, I knew their science, and I knew how they're getting used in the real world. And that was my angle. And I thought, but now I have to have a book because I don't have a higher degree. So you got to have a book. You know, where's your book? Got to have your book. I'm like, well, I'll just write my first book about weed. You know, then it'll take what, a year and a half or a year. I'll have it done. Bing, bang, boom. I have my first book. And that was my great hubris. I didn't know about anandamide at that point. I didn't know about the endocannabinoid system. I didn't know any legendary figures like Jack Herrera. I didn't know how far back it went in human history. And so after that, it was five years of research, traveling around the country, reading lots of books, traveling over, uh, in Europe and to Israel, 
uh, interviewing scientists and lots of people involved with this until I finally got a general grasp of the system. And I'm still no expert, but at least I had a general grasp at that point. And on my last research trip, I decided to take one big fat book along, like I always do, one big fat book of fiction. And I'd been calling anandamide my great white whale. This first neurotransmitter cannabinoid ever discovered was my great white whale. But I didn't know what that meant. I just knew it was from Moby Dick. So I took Moby Dick along and I was immediately enthralled and still am to this day. Of course, it makes sense. He is an obsessive Dutchman who grew up in the church. I'm also an obsessive Dutchman who grew up in the church. And so sometimes people just make sense to you. Um, he did, but I realized before I was a hundred pages in that this was exactly the metaphor to explain the complexities of the endocannabinoid system. He's talking about whales, he's talking about the food webs, he's talking about how all this stuff works. And it just lined up so perfectly to what was happening. And also the Captain Ahab part, was the other half of the coin. That's the war on drugs. That is this maniacal hunt. It just works so, so well. And there's 135 chapters in Moby Dick. I got home from this trip. I read Moby Dick again and put the notes on the wall about what was happening in the book. And then I layered on top the human history and the scientific discoveries. And it worked so well that it was, it felt like a mystical event. And it's only been continued to work so well. As you put these food webs onto what's happening in the cell, it just uh, meshes together. Because we know an incredible amount how, about how all the molecules involved and, and how a cell works, but any biochemist is going to say, you know, this hasn't been elucidated yet. And it's actually really similar with oceanography, where a lot of the same discoveries happen in oceanography at the same time they happen in brain science. But the ocean is a very hard thing to study. It's very big, it's very violent, and there are things that matter in it that are very, very small, like phytoplankton and krill and bacteria. And so that's the same that's true with biochemistry. In the study of the chemistry of life, you can't see most of the things that you're dealing with. And so I always say that, Trying to do biochemistry is like studying oceanography from the moon using shitty telescopes. It's a very hard thing to do. And since the ocean is the most unexplored part of the planet and the brain is the most unexplored part of us, we're going to treat the human brain like the ocean. An ocean filled with billions of underwater water cities, all the size and complexity of London, and all in a complex, constant web of communication. So that's the, the main idea. And so let's meet some of the denizens. So the endocannabinoids will be whales, and there's a number of different types of them. The phytocannabinoids from the plant will be elephants, because actually elephants are just whales on land. They're both what they're called, uh, known as K2 species, which are species so big that no one else really screws with them, um, except maybe they try to eat their babies. But they just spend their lives eating, socializing, and developing really big brains and complex uh, social networks and are usually led by females. And the cool part about how well this works is that look at the anandamide and 2-AG molecules at the top there. They kind of look like whales. They're these long, skinny fatty acids. And then look at the, the phytocannabinoids. They kind of look like elephants with their two or three rings. And if you were looking at these different classes of molecules, you would never guess that they're working on the same receptors and doing somewhat similar things. They look very, very different. But in fact, they work together really well. And so elephants and whales. And then finally, the synthetic cannabinoids in the lab Thank you, Google, for this beautiful image of a half whale, half uh, elephant. And these synthetic cannabinoids are usually something like that. They're slight alterations made to the cannabinoids found in nature, either in the plant or inside of us. And they're used to probe the endocannabinoid system. They might have slightly different features so we can figure out and tease out effects of what's happening. And so let's look at these two that we want to dive into the most. These are the two I hope you walk away from this lecture really knowing and being able to talk a little bit about anandamide and 2-AG. So in our metaphor, anandamide is the sperm whale, which is the biggest thing with teeth that's ever lived on the planet, bigger than any dinosaur. 2-AG is the blue whale, which is simply the biggest thing that ever lived. And so these are two incredibly important neurotransmitters, but they were only discovered about 25 years ago. And so as I said earlier, THC and the other cannabinoids, they were somewhat like hooks. We found these elephants in the cannabis plant. We realized that this is what was making us feel the effects. 
Uh, THC and CBD were finally solved structurally in 1963 and 1964. Uh, but these neurotransmitters weren't discovered until the early 90s. So that's a 25 year gap where we, we knew the elephants, but we were still using them. It was like we had the elephants as hooks and we dropped them down into the human brain and finally used it to pull up these whales these great white whales. And when we finally looked down, we realized not only are there whales swimming around in their brains, there's billions of them. They are an incredibly important neurotransmitter system, as important as serotonin or dopamine or endorphins, or these other sexy ones you hear about more in the news. And so it was the path to the plant that helped us discover these endocannabinoids inside us. There are a couple other types for endocannabinoids. There are eight to 10, depending on who's counting. And most of them aren't very well studied, unfortunately. The top here is anandamide and 2-AG, uh, those you know. The middle three, we don't know much about, uh, just like the whales they represent. NADA, uh, NADA, nolanded ether, virodhamine, uh, virodamine, it's always a tough one to say. Those aren't as well known. The two bottom ones are two to keep your eye on, PEA and oleamide, also known as OEA. So PEA for us will be a right whale and oleamide will be a humpback whale. These are molecules you can actually buy on Amazon right now. And they are incredible products. Uh, and actually PEA, if you're in the States, my company I work for CV Sciences sells a product with PEA in it because PEA is a amazing cannabinoid. It is maybe even safer than CBD, which is really saying something. And it has all of these positive effects uh, upon the system. I, I have lots of papers on, on this one. And it might be the next hot cannabinoid that you start seeing getting added in the dietary supplement areas where you go shopping. Oleamide is another interesting one because oleamide was initially linked to sleep. That's why I like the humpback whale singing you to sleep. The cool part about oleamide is not only does it help you sleep, if you took one little spoonful off of your out of your bag from Amazon, it, it will help you sleep. If you take four little spoonfuls, it's a really nice high. It's a psychoactivity that's not quite like THC, but something in that realm. Uh, I know Hamilton Morris, the, the great uh, drug journalist, says this is his favorite way to get high. Um, I think he meant in general, not just on cannabinoids, uh, which is fascinating. So these are two to watch, PEA and OEA. And... It's really important to talk about the synthesis and breakdown of neurotransmitters because you never want too, med too much of anything. With neurotransmitters, you're always seeking a, a balance. And that balance is always kind of going up and down, but you want to overload your brain with anything. And so when the brain needs more nondamide or 2-AG, it synthesizes it. And when it has too much, it breaks it down. The fascinating part thing to me is the anandamide molecule, we don't exactly know how it's being synthesized. There have been four different pathways that have been worked out to how anandamide gets synthesized in a cell, but none of them really account for the majority of the anandamide that you see. And so you could say, we know the sperm whale's there, but we don't know how it's reproducing. We don't know where this anandamide is coming from, which is actually true in the ocean realm too. We've never seen a sperm whale make love. We don't, we assume they do, and we assume they, we, that they reproduce that way. But for all of the whale scientists that are out there, none have ever seen sperm whales uh, making love. So it's, it's a, an odd similarity. And those just keep popping up. It's amazing to see how, how much the ocean and the human brain just line up so perfectly. The thing to keep an eye on to control the levels of anandamide is FA enzyme, fatty acid amide hydrolase. But the thing that's important about FA is it breaks down anandamide. And so in our metaphor, we're going to call it a, a giant deep sea squid. It's like this giant squid finds these sperm whales and just slices them into pieces and makes less of them as a way to control them. And so a big target of pharmaceutical drugs and um, other things seeking to work with the endocannabinoid system is to lower the activity of FA. That's actually something that CBD does. CBD has many actions uh, at the cellular level. It's part of the reason it's so interesting to study, but also very complex and hard to tease out why it works so well. CBD makes the FA enzyme work not quite as well. It doesn't inactivate it completely, but it makes it work not quite as well. So if your giant sea squid is a little bit slower and a little bit duller, you're going to have more anandamide levels slowly creeping up in your brain. And since Anandamide could be called your neurotransmitter of balance. In general, that's a good thing. And so 
not only do people use CBD, scientists are looking for other drugs that could also inhibit FA and raise your anandamide levels. Luckily for 2-AG, uh, we know more. The, it's synthesized by an enzyme called DAGL, and it's broken down by an enzyme called MAGL, which I think is something like a giant California squid. And I also like the size of these. Anandamide generally travels farther, just like sperm whales are known for traveling very far. Anandamide in the brain can travel a couple of neurons away. A lot of uh, neurotransmitters only go very short distances, just the next neuron over. 2-AG is like that. 2-AG is, works in a very small area. Anandamide is a wanderer. It can affect an entire small brain region, uh, which I think lines up well to this. And so these are the whales, anandamide and 2-AG, the main two to know. But where are they going? How are they doing what they do? Just because they're swimming around doesn't mean that they have any action. This is the other piece to know right here. CB1 and CB2. These are receptors on the surface of cells. So if we went back to our uh, city metaphor, these would be built into the city walls. And a piece of the city wall would be that gray in the middle. And so you have part of this receptor sitting outside the city walls, part of it sitting inside, passing on messages. And so the, the binding site is on the outside. Anandamide, 2-AG, THC, they would come to this outside of the receptor, bind to it, and the inside would pass on its messages. Though the history of CB1 needs a little story to, and a little deep dive into the, the chemistry of what's going on to explain how important it is and why its discovery was so mind-blowing for neuropsychopharmacologists. These are what's called a G-protein coupled receptor. They're also known as a seven transmembrane uh, receptor because they go through the membrane seven times. And these are absolutely the most complex type of receptor that is on a human cell, on, on pretty much any cell. There are other simpler types of receptors that might just pass a molecule through or allow some charged ions to get through to change the electrical balance. Um, these are very complex signaling molecules. In fact, there's been seven Nobel Prizes awarded for figuring out different parts of how the G-protein coupled receptors pass on their signal. That's how complex they are. As to how important they are, over 50% of all pharmaceutical drugs that are approved in the United States and England, they are aimed at some G-protein coupled receptor. So that's how important these are. Pharmaceutical, this is a huge area of study. There's only a couple hundred G-protein coupled receptors that are known. Uh, some of them are really well studied. A lot are what are called orphans. We know they're there because they're in the genes. We have no idea what they do or what binds to them. And so they're a furious uh, study around G-protein coupled receptors. They're, they're a fundamental part of human health. Pharmaceutical companies are always looking at them. Uh, academic labs are always looking at them. And so the story goes, the phytocannabinoids were figured out in the 60s, and there was this hunt to try to figure out where was THC going to make people high? How was it working? And they, scientists could not figure it out, couldn't figure it out until finally in 1989, uh, NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse in the United States, they had a meeting where they gathered academic scientists, scientists from industry, as well as government scientists, and they got them all together. And there was a woman there named Dr. Alin Howlett, uh, a personal hero, and she met two of the guys from Pfizer back when Pfizer had a cannabinoid research program, and they had attached a radioactive probe to a synthetic cannabinoid. So it was a way to be able to watch where it was going. In our metaphor, this would absolutely be an elephant with a radar detector tied to its tail. That's basically what it was. You could, using an x-ray, you could trace to see where this cannabinoid was going. And she knew this was just what she needed to try to, to figure out once and for all where this was binding. And so she asked them for that uh, probe and they sent it to her and she applied it to the brain of a pig. And she, as she tells a story, when she first got the plate back after the uh, using the x-rays, she thought this can't be right. The entire top of the brain was dyed almost black. Uh, and there was none basically down in the lower sections controlling breathing and vital functions like that, which is why you can't overdose on cannabis. And she thought this must be a mistake. This must be binding indiscriminately, as they say. It must not, it must be binding all these different places. But she worked all these ways to try to disprove her results. And finally, she realized this is really the thing. And she was the one who put together that, that it is the CB1 receptor that causes the psychoactive effects from THC. 
She was also the one to realize that the CB1 receptor is, drum roll please, the most widespread G protein couple receptor in the human nervous system. That was gigantic. I mean, before this, cannabis was interesting because it had so many different effects on the human mind that people who studied drugs knew that there was something fascinating here. But if you study the brain and you realize all of a sudden that this is the most widespread of this arguably most important receptor class, this is something that really matters. And it started to lead to a lot more research these last 30 years. It's been picking up a lot more and there's a lot more studies going to this. And that gives a little hint of how important and widespread this endocannabinoid system is. So I said there was a yin and yang to a lot of this. They say a non-domide and 2-AG have a yin and yang. You also say with CB1 and CB2 that there's a yin and yang effect. The CB1 receptor is generally found mostly in the brain. The CB2 receptor is mostly found in the body. It is very connected to the immune system. Though you do have CB2 receptors in the brain's immune cells, and you do have CB1 receptors on many of the organs as well. But in general, that's a good way to remember it. CB1 up here, CB2 down here. And so in our little metaphor then, what would this be? It's something that lives in the walls of the cell. The whales and elephants come to the outside and then pass on their signal. The only thing that made sense to me is these are bars. These are whale bars living on the outside. The whales come, they whisper their message, whatever it is, and the cell, depending on what cell type it is, does something and reacts to what the whale says. And just like in real cities, a lot of the governance doesn't get done in city hall. It gets done in bars. It gets done where some people over a table kind of be like, you think it should be like this? Yeah, I think it should be like this. And then it goes like that. And so if CB1 is a, a regular bar, then I think CB2 would be a gay bar for whales. Um, and I think that makes a lot of sense. If you look at the bottom, it says homology. That means how similar they are. Some receptors are very similar to each other and some are not that similar. Uh, CB1 and CB2 are 44% similar to each other, uh, which I think uh, a straight bar and a gay bar are actually 44% similar to each other. So it, it works out perfectly. And just to show all the different areas that this is in, what you'll notice is you see a lot of hormone centers, a lot of glands and things like that. And you see, and you also see uh, immune centers. There is a theory that it's a false division between the brain and the immune cell system and the hormonal system. And the idea is that you should really be viewing white blood cells as traveling neurons. And you should be viewing hormones as slow neurons. And really, these are three systems that are only divided because the cells look somewhat differently. But really, they're so entwined with each other. The brain affects the immune cells. The hormones affect the immune cells. They all affect each other in this you know, beautifully complex triangle. And so the endocannabinoid system is so intimately involved with all three of those systems. And I once heard a, a scientist after a conference at the bar say that if you told me the endocannabinoid system is where the body meets the soul, I would believe you. These are the kind of things scientists say at the bar and not from the podium, but it's getting at something really true. The endocannabinoid system is a, a glue. It's, or I've heard it referred to as a thermostat. It's like you have an octopus at the center of you that has a million arms and its little thermostats go to all these different places and they work towards balance. They work towards homeostasis. Calling the endocannabinoid system your balance system is a great word for it. So that is to set up the four most important things, the CB1 and CB2 receptors and the anandamide and 2-AG that bind to them. Um, just to finish off our metaphor, I was going to take more time on this slide, but you can read my books. I have three books done out of the 130, so I have 132 more books to go. But don't worry, it's all worked out. I have it all on the walls. Um, and so if the cannabinoids are whales, then serotonin would have to be a dolphin. Uh, dopamine, your uh, molecule of addiction, would be a shark. Adrenaline would be an electric eel. Uh, I like endorphins being... Jellyfish, I could just imagine laying in a sea of jellyfish that kind of sting you with beautiful morphine and you just lay there kind of in trance like a field of poppies. And the last two, I just want, the main reason I, I decided to keep this slide is because of the GABA and the glutamate that you see. These aren't quite as sexy. You probably haven't heard of them as much um, if you're not following this stuff closely, but I made them in the very bottom of the food chain. 
uh, for a reason because they're so basic. GABA on the lower left is your brain's basic inhibitory neurotransmitter. When the brain wants a neuron to calm down and stop its firing, it uses GABA. It's your ba brain's basic red light. Some of these others have more complex functions. GABA is stop. Glutamate is the exact opposite. It is the most common excitatory neurotransmitter. That's green. It's go. And so you could say GABA is the algae at the bottom of the food web, and that glutamate is the phytoplankton. And the main reason I wanted to mention these is because the endocannabinoids are so involved with those two neurotransmitters specifically. They're actually involved with all of these, just to speak to how many systems it interacts with, but GABA and glutamate the most. And so the endocannabinoid system has the basic green light and red light signals in its back pockets. Uh, to paraphrase Stephen Wright, it's a little bit like putting a humidifier and a dehumidifier in the same room and letting them fight it out. That's what the endocannabinoid system does for brain health. And that actually helps protect the brain a lot. So the last part to cover before we get to our five minute Q&A just on, the, on this uh, first basic parts is how the G protein coupled receptors pass on their signal. So if you see, you have all of these, on the right is a, is a little mock-up of the CB1 receptor. If it got bound to all of those G protein uh, things underneath, these are different signals getting passed on. That would be like signal fish. The whales come in up here at the top, they bind here, and all of these tiny little G protein receptors that took seven Nobel prizes to figure out how they pass on their message and everything they do and how they do it in different uh, ways, these would be signal fish. The great part is these little fish are actually called signal fish. These are, they're found in the Indian Ocean. I think it's beautiful. As always, the sea provides our metaphor for us. It's not that I'm just stoned a lot. This works so well that it's eerie. It's like it's coming from outside me. The thing to know at the top here, what this is talking about with GABA, this means dopamine, these are the opioid receptors, it's adenosine. This is what's called heterocomplexes and homocomplexes. And it's the last thing to cover that's new. What happens is that and this has only been known for a short time, and I don't think it's that well understood what's happening, but we now know receptors on the surface of the cell can join up to each other. And when they do that, different things happen. Uh, CB1 can bind to itself, actually. A CB1 bound to itself is slightly different than a CB1 by itself. CB1 can also form a complex with CB2. That would be called a heterocomplex, two different types being bound to each other. But, they, but the cannabinoids don't only bind to themselves. They also bind to a bunch of other uh, receptor types, like dopamine, like opioids. Uh, I don't know why serotonin isn't on here, but you know these are really famous neurotransmitters for a reason. And what we know is the CB1 receptor or the CB2 receptor can join up with one of these and they do different things when they're together. A CB1 with a dopamine is activated in a different way, usually the same things activate it, but then it passes on its signal in a different way as well. So it's not very well known. This is a fairly new concept. We know it's happening, but we don't know exactly what the downstream effects are. Uh, it's still being worked out. And just to add it, because um, I had to sneak this in somewhere because the metaphor of it's so beautiful. In this paper uh, that came out not too long ago, the researchers had found previously that repeated exposure to cannabinoids, if you kept giving a, giving a mouse cannabinoids, it caused one of the key serotonin receptors on the outside of the cell to join up with a key dopamine receptor on the outside of the cell. So you could say that's your, your serotonin is your, your neurotransmitter of happiness. Dopamine is your neurotransmitter of addiction, also learning. So the presence of cannabinoids made the serotonin and dopamine receptors join together and have different downstream effects. And so in our neural ocean metaphor, this means that the presence of whales causes the gymnasiums of dolphins to join up with the tattoo parlors of sharks to create a whole new kind of place to hang out. It's perfect. It's so perfect as soon as I discovered it. The gymnasiums of dolphins, the tattoo parlors of sharks, and it makes a brand new kind of receptor that does a brand new thing. And it's the presence of the cannabinoids that makes it happen. I thought that was really beautiful. So this is the last slide I'll leave it on. And just to have our basics in front of us for this last five minute Q&A, there's one last thing to cover though, is that 2-AG, a non-demyo THC, they bind to both of these, the CB1 receptor and the CB2 
receptor. Um, by the way, THT is the African elephant because the African elephant is much more dangerous, just like THT is. And anyone who says THT is completely safe is full of shit. Um, I mean, it's pretty safe as far as drugs go, but you know, there's definitely uh, problems from long-term chronic use or acute uh, use of a lot of it. The thing about CBD is that it doesn't bind to either of these. And it's really interesting what it does here. CBD is what's known as an allosteric modulator. And so that's what here at the bottom, it's the last part I'll explain. Receptors always have an orthosteric site. That means the, the general binding site where the thing binds to it. In our case, it's a, a non-demide binding to the CB1. It binds the CB1 at the orthosteric site. It's the classic binding site. The allosteric site is another site on the transmitter somewhere. You know, say if this my if my fist is the receptor and up here is is where the things bind, the allosteric site might be down here. And if something fills up that allosteric site, it gently changes the shape of the receptor. And it can do that in a positive way or a negative way. It can make it can change the shape so things bind to it better, or it can change the shape so things don't bind to it as well. And in this case, CBD is a negative allosteric modulator of CB1. And what that means is other things are not going to bind as well to CB1 if CBD is present. That is most likely the reason that CBD can protect you from getting way too high on THC. In California, I've heard about when grandmas sometimes get too high on edibles because they're too potent. I don't know what they're getting into. And they're having a, a, a freak out because it's just way too much THC. It can be like a psychedelic level of intoxication at that point. And from their grandchildren or whoever's there, they're given dabs of CBD, you know, a, a inhalation of a bunch of CBD just like that. And it is like a rip cord. It pulls them down so fast. CBD can be a protector from the psychoactive effects. So if you have li if you are liable to getting paranoid or negative feelings from THC, taking a bunch of CBD ahead of time might have help you have a nicer psychoactive trip with THC. I'll leave it there in case anybody wants to ask some questions about these basics in front of us. It's basically three yin and yangs that we have. It's stressful times in a stressful world. It's easy to feel tense, irritable, and discontented, but it doesn't have to be that way. There's many ways to take care of yourself, and now we're adding one more, calm gummies. Here at CV Sciences, we combined three powerful ingredients into a tasty gummy to help support a sense of relaxation and a zen state of mind. We start with our signature, 10 milligrams of CBD and a full spectrum hemp extract. Then we add 100 milligrams of L-theanine, the bioactive molecule inside of green tea that causes its relaxing effects. And then 50 milligrams of 5-HTP, an amino acid that is a precursor to serotonin, often called your neurotransmitter of contentment. So it's these three calming ingredients all together in a delicious gummy flavored with organic cane sugar and organic tapioca syrup. It's a wonderful and cost-effective way to give you a sense of relaxation and to support a healthy stress response. For 25% off, use a coupon code LEXFILES. Try a calm gummy today from CV Sciences and see what it can do for your levels of calm. So we've just had one question come up here. Can you discuss the long-term chronic effects of THC on the brain and nervous system? And what is defined by chronic? Great question, Meg. Great question. Um, thank you. It's a tough one. Um, I'll start with the second one because there's no answer there. Chronic is, is kind of a wiggly term. Everyone's going to have a different say in what chronic is. But most likely, uh, somebody would say daily use uh, for many years. So the, the long-term effects of THC on the brain are there's a lot. Of them, none of them are that bad, but you can kind of see it in more in the real world examples than you do from long-term studies and stuff like that. It's hard to study cohorts of people for, for 30 years and see what the negatives are. Um, but there is a, on the brain itself, there is a slowing down. For one, you can blunt the CB1 receptors. The more, the more smoking you do, the more you're gonna downgrade the receptors. Just like when you take MDMA and you're bombing your brain with serotonin, you're gonna also have less serotonin receptors uh, for a while, especially if you're doing all the time. And that can lead to you know, not being able to feel serotonin in the same kind of way. And so that can happen with THC as well. Also, THC can 
make subtle changes to the hormones, uh, especially in men. I mean, they talk about older stoners getting man boobs. Um, that's not, that makes sense from what we know about it, that there's some feminization there of switching the hormones. And the memory stuff is, is real. The, there's a huge number of CB1 receptors in the hippocampus, which is the main memory area of the brain. There's many, and actually we don't really know where memories are stored or how all that works, but something about the hippocampus is incredibly mixed up with memory. And it's absolutely true that if you smoke weed, you won't remember the next two hours as well. If you watch a movie when you're high, you're not going to remember it as well. You might feel like you do, and that's why THC can be so dangerous for adolescents. Dangerous in the sense of they're not going to learn as much in school. And it seems like there would be a long-term effect there. I mean, science, people have been looking for this. The anti-drug abuse, the drug abuse researchers have been wanting to find really negative memory effects. And they have found perhaps moderate negative memory effects. That being said, it's not like it's a huge number of chronic problems. It's just you kind of start acting like you're stoned all the time. It's not the end of the world, but we've all kind of seen it happen. That being said, it's very protective of the brain. All Because you're not only getting THC, you're getting other cannabinoids and the terpenes. Something about weed is very, very protective of the brain. The, uh, the, next, the next half is uh, going to be focused about half on neurons. And you'll see about it's so intimately tied up with our brain and the neurons. And overall, I think it's the protective thing. Um, the negative, I will say, that probably matters the most is when kids are young, there is this small but real link between the earlier the age you start smoking weed, high THC cannabis, and getting schizophrenia. And it's not a very large correlation, but it's certainly true. And I think anybody in the real world has also seen it happen. Uh, a really, really bad weed trip can be a trigger that I think would bring out schizophrenia in somebody who otherwise wouldn't have it. Just like a car accident or a death in the family can bring out someone in schizophrenia who otherwise probably wouldn't have had an onset at all. And I do have a guess on this, and I haven't really seen this theory anywhere else, but the thing about the developing brain is that around the start of puberty, your brain is overwired. During your growing years, you have so many connections between all these different parts of the brain. And what makes your brain into a mature adult brain, which only ends at about 25, it's from like 13 to 25 that your brain is going to the next level. What's happening there is you're actually losing synaptic connections. Sometimes tens of thousands of connections a day are being lost from your brain during adolescence. And that's a good thing. You can picture the brain before puberty as like an unwieldy bush that is overgrown. And the sculpting that happens throughout adolescence turns it into a finely humming machine that isn't overconnected. And schizophrenia seems to be disease of overconnection. And I have a guess that because THC and the other cannabinoids are protecting the brain so much, they are allowing those connections to stay there. And the brain stays in this more wild, woolly, not trimmed place. And that's why this might be a link to schizophrenia. But I haven't seen much on why that's actually happening like that. But it, you know, I'm not going to tell kids not to smoke weed when they're young, but, you know, it would be my encouragement is to hold off on that. There, there is a link there. It's not the end of the world and alcohol is worse for you and all of that. But, you know, you can't say weed at 14 is a great thing for kids. I'm also not going to stop them because you try to stop them, you're going to make things worse. But we need to know that's the truth of what this drug can do. So that's a little bit on the brain. Um, let's see. Oh, SAF, teaching a CBD rich regimen, overall health and wellness. Uh, yes. Um, I think a little bit of THC is incredibly good for the brain. And uh, CBD like a vitamin is a great description of it. Just to, I had one scientist say, if you're not taking 50 milligrams of CBD every day, when you're over 50, you're crazy. And there's a lot of truth to that. Anyone elderly in your life should consider taking a lot of CBD. Uh, overall, it is breathing and types of breathing influence the endocannabinoid system. Oh, that's great. Well, the first thing to say is smoking, the nice part is smoking weed doesn't affect your breathing. Um, it's not going to lower your breathing or your like, um, opioids can or, or some of the other things. But it does seem like uh, holotropic breathwork and things like that are working via uh, somewhat via endocannabinoids. And you can breathe and make yourself more high using anandamide. Um, and I don't know a ton of that 
about that. But I was, I had to cut this slide because of the lack of time, but all of these interesting alternative therapies, it seems like acupuncture is working at least partially via the endocannabinoid system. Your CB1 receptors go up, your CB2, your anandamide levels go up when the needles go in you. It could be that part of what acupuncture is tapping into is the endocannabinoid system. The other one that's really fascinating is the runner's high. So the runner's high is not endorphins. It's, it's not completely shown that this is true, but it seems more and more likely this is that is true. The runner's high is mediated by endocannabinoids. So when you get addicted to running, dad, um, it is probably because it is anandamide flooding your brain and you're getting this natural whale of contentment. It's not quite THC, but um, THC binds really strongly to CB1. Anandamide doesn't bind quite as strongly. So it could be that that's where the runner's high is coming from. So Lex, um, how about we go back to the rest of the slideshow now and then come to more of the questions at the end. Um, okay. And those watching the recording can always, um, yeah, sort of. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. These are, I love these questions that I see, but I really wanted to make sure I was covering the basics here instead of the, the in-depth stuff. Thanks for these great questions. I hope to get to all of them for sure. So first two parts are going to be on brain cells specifically. So neurogenesis or cloning London. So we just have to explain a little bit about the basics of the brain. This is a neuron. On the left is the dendrites. This you could call the ear. This is where all it's listening to all the upstream signals from other neurons. Uh, neurotransmitters are coming in. It's receiving their messages. Uh, these are the communication in. Then the axon is where it releases its neurotransmitters. This could be serotonin or GABA or glutamate or the endocannabinoids getting released from the axon. So you have ears on one side, mouth on the other. And what happens is all of these incoming signals are trying to say, put either more or less electricity into this nucleus body. And once the electricity gets past a certain threshold, then bam, it's an action potential. It is that electrical nature of the brain. And this rockets down here and says, release the neurotransmitters down to the next stream one. And we'll cover that uh, more in the next section. But that's the basics of how this works. And so it actually goes back to a long debate whether the brain was one big organ or made up of a bunch of little cells. And it turns out, yes, it is 100 billion cells. The thing is, is that for most of the history of the last 120 years, when we realized it was individual neurons, we thought that from the age of two or so, you had the exact same number of neurons for your whole life, except a slight, you know, just a down, a downhill that you had a certain number of neurons by the age of two, and that's all you got, and there was no more brain cell uh, growth. That these brain cells lived with you for 80 years, which is an amazing time. And that's tr still true for most of the brain. Most of the, the brain cells you have have been with you your entire life. Your skin has been replaced every month, I think is the number. Um, your brain cells have lasted this whole time, which is an amazing feat for a tiny little cell. But it was only in 1998 that this got upended. There were rumors, there was speculation that maybe neurogenesis occurred in adults. Maybe as we're at this age, in some parts of our brain, we're still generating new brain cells. And the first proof of that only came in 1998. And it's actually still not accepted by all researchers in the field uh, for humans. It's been pretty darn proven in animal models, in mice and rats and, and things like that. You can see new brain cells being uh, formed, especially in the hippocampus, that memory area that I mentioned earlier. But you can't, it's much harder to prove neurogenesis in adults, mostly because you can't take an adolescent and add a toxic dye to their brain and then sacrifice them a few months later as much as you might want to. It's, it's uh, apparently unethical. And so, but most neurologists would believe that you are now creating new brain cells. And so how are you doing this? You have these neural stem cells, you know, and I think you've probably heard about stem cells before. They're, they're uh, almost like immortal cells that can divide to recreate themselves, or they can divide off into a path and become more and more differentiated until they become the cell that you want to have. In this case, these neural stem cells can become a number of different other uh, cell types. In this case, it's going to become a new, a brand new neuron. And so they, they move, they get to the right place, they get uh, massaged by some of the immune cells in the brain, and they finally get there. And then they start to branch into this beautiful, this is called arborization, which I think is a beautiful 
word for it. And so in our metaphor, what would a neuroprogenitor cell be? It would absolutely be London circa 1300. So London, uh, 700 years ago, had 80,000 people in it, and it was something area of a square mile. And so it had all of the seeds inside of it that would become the London we know today, but it was still a very little London here along the Thames. And so it had to float and migrate and float around until it became this city today of 9 million people covering 607 square miles. This is basically what happens when these cells do their thing. They go from London of 700 years ago to London of today. And so the endocannabinoid system drives this neural progenitor cell proliferation. Here, and actually I'm gonna put up the next part that has some of these pieces to it. And so on the left and right, you can see the neurons in the green. The astrocytes and microglial cells, these are immune system cells that they used to think were kind of junk or just like support gray matter, you know, not the good stuff. Um, and it turns out they're incredibly important. This is a little bit similar to what we used to call junk DNA because it was non-coding. Now we realize that it's called it's actually regulatory DNA and is probably more important in some ways than the coding DNA. And so thing whenever in science something gets scoffed at, at as like a backwater, it's not that important. It turns out it's probably pretty important. Uh, the brain is a a careful housekeeper, as some famous scientist said, it's not going to keep things around. They're going to cost too much metabolic energy when it caught, you know, when it's hard to stay alive. And so these astrocytes and microglial cells are support cells that help direct the neuron to where it's going and help support it throughout its life. And so the proliferation is maintained by the endocannabinoid system. So if you want to have new Londons, you need a network of whales to keep up your supply of proto-Londons, of early Londons. And then for the growth of the axons going out up here, the mouth part, activation of CB1 receptor is required for axonal growth response. And so the CB1 helps the axon decide where it's going. In that arborization process, that's the CB1. So if you want your uh, neuron city to talk with the rest of the world, you have to build the communications uh, systems to do so. So you have to have whale bars and you have to have whales hanging out there to make this communication system to lay it down. So as these neural stem cells go through this process and they mature, their levels of CB2 go down and their levels of CB1 go up. So in these young proto-Londons, lots of gay whale bars, lots of them. But once gentrification starts, the CB1 levels start to go up. And, you know, then more yuppies, more regular whale bars. I mean, you know, we've seen it a million times. After that, the growth and guidance of the axons is heavily regulated, again, this part, um, by 2AG, by the blue whale. So to decide where it's laying down these vital communication systems to so all the other cities that are out there, it takes huge teams of blue whales to lay down the outer suburbs of London, which form the communication channels with the rest of the world. And so the last part of this is that cannabinoids actually promote neurogenesis. It's not only that the whales help you make new Londons, uh, lots of other sea creatures are involved too. But if you have whales, you'll have more Londons. And who wouldn't want more Londons? Except anybody from Newcastle. <clears throat> Actually, I had to look up who hated London the most. And Newcastle won, but it seemed like it was everybody else outside London, which as someone who spent a lot of time in New York, I understand. The last part to mention here, in the science of figuring this stuff out, uh, there's something called knockout organisms. In this case, knockout mice. That is when you, it used to be very hard to do this, to create a knockout mice. You would have a mouse that wouldn't have something in its genetic code. It used to be a lot harder to manipulate the DNA. Now, thanks to the revolution of something called CRISPR, we can now much easily splice DNA and micro make organisms like this. But if you have a mouse that doesn't have any CB1 or CB2 receptors, neurogenesis still happens in the mouse brain, but it's much reduced. So if you're trying to clone London, but it doesn't have any whale bars, it doesn't have any gay whale bars, nobody gets so excited about the project. And I think that really helps to explain what's going on here. So that's the piece on neurogenesis. And the next part is somewhat related because it is another brain section. This is called retrograde transmission. 
And so just to play off a little bit what we were talking about earlier, you have, just like I said, you have the sending neuron going down here to the axons that are sending their message. This is electricity. And then right in here is the synapse to the next neuron downstream. And when you zoom in on it, it's this tiny little cleft. And I have to talk about this part because I just love this part of history. There was a huge debate for a long time in neurochemistry. Very angry. Scientists at these conferences can just get into their camps and just not even want to look at the other goddamn sons of bitches. So it was the soup versus spark debate. And it and the whole debate was, is the brain basically electrical in nature or is it using chemical messengers? And there was this huge back and forth because it's easy to measure the electrical signals going on in there. But is that just a byproduct? But it was also, you know, they were starting to find early neurotransmitters like acetylcholine. It's like, well, this is what's making it happen. And they would just argue and argue about this. And nobody knew what was going on until they finally put together that the answer, as always, when you have two opposing camps, is both. Within the neuron, it's electrical. It sends its messages down to the end with electricity. In between the neurons, it's chemical. And that explains the speed of, of chemical, of uh, neural transmission in the brain. It's not quite as fast as electricity, which is basically the speed of light. And it's not as slow as you know a molecule uh, diffusing across the entire brain. It's a mixture of electrical neurons communi communicating to each other chemically. And so the chemicals in our case are the whales and the dolphins and the sharks and things like that. They're getting used in this little synaptic cleft. And so what is the purpose of our neuronal underwater cities? Its purpose is the fire and action potential. That is when in this sending neuron, it has enough messages saying fire the torpedoes. It's basically what a neuron does. It's a neuron's activation state where it says, okay, I'm going to release my neurotransmitters and pass on my message. And that's how the brain gets things done. Of course, it sometimes needs to not get things done, not get too overexcited. And so here you can see what happens. You have a stimulus. The neuron gets stimulated. It, the neurotransmitters from upstream are letting more ele uh, electrical ions into the cell. It finally gets to a certain threshold and then bam, the entire, it, it fires a huge stream of electricity down this chute, and, and here it's, it releases the neurotransmitters for their being stored. And it overshoots, and then it comes back to baseline, so it can only do it so many times. And so that's basically how the brain works. And the canonical idea for almost all of neuronal history, as long as we're studying this, is that information flows in one direction. It goes from here down to here, and it doesn't go backwards. But the, there's an obvious logical flaw there from an engineering perspective, which is that would be a positive feedback loop. It could keep spiraling itself up, but it needs a way to calm itself down. Positive feedback loops are so dangerous because it can spiral something out of control. That's what epilepsy is. Epilepsy is overexcitation of a certain part of the brain. It's just firing way too much electricity. Um, and it, of course, it damages the brain and also just screws up the functions at the higher levels. And so it would make sense that there's some kind of negative feedback loop in the brain. And this is where our heroes, the endocannabinoids, come into play. It's called retrograde signaling. You can see it down here. Non-retrograde signaling is standard. You know, the, the, re, the neurotransmitters are released and they bind down here. Retrograde signaling is when the receiving neuron releases endocannabinoids, especially 2-AG, especially the blue whale, and it goes back to CB1 receptors on the sending neuron. And basically the blue whale goes to the bar and says, calm down, we got it, shut up. And it is a way for the neuron downstream to, to, to calm down the neuron upstream. And so this makes sense why CBD has been a literal miracle cure for a lot of children with very severe forms of epilepsy. And that actually happened where in, at GW Pharma in England. They were the first to bring CBD to market as a, as a drug. And when they give CBD to children with severe epilepsy, uh, with you know, sometimes hundreds of seizures per day, they're giving hundreds or thousands of milligrams of CBD to them. That's how safe CBD is, by the way. The main problems that you see are perhaps some stomach upset. You might have a loose stool or something like that. Um, 
but it's it's amazing how much CBD you can give to a young child and have it be fine. And all of a sudden they go from dozens of seizures a day to like one or two a week. What started all this off was a young girl named Charlotte Fiji. Uh, if you look her up, uh, Charlotte's Web, you can see one of the first stories that really broke into the national consciousness about how amazing CBD can be for epilepsy. And it's partially because of this. And the fascinating part is, the only things that cause retrograde signaling in the brain are the endocannabinoids and then nitric oxide. Uh, nitric oxide, the gas that's in the air, is actually also a really important signaling molecule. So those are the only two things that do this. And it speaks to how important the endocannabinoid system is in the brain and for protecting the brain. And just to show this beautiful little graphic about it. So here's the synaptic cleft. And you can see the anandamide going backwards, the 2-AG going backwards. So the signal is coming from up here. It's releasing, in this case, glutamate, which says go. It's green light, fire message. And this, and this reacts. The glutamate comes down here, and it says it releases the 2-AG. It releases the anandamide and says calm down, slow down. And then you have this FA enzyme to help not have too much anandamide so you don't calm down the brain too much. It's a delicate balance, but... That's why the endocannabinoid is so important in protecting the brain is because of this negative feedback loop of retrograde signaling. So those are the two neuron sections, and I just have two sections left on two other important organelles. So the next one is the mitochondria. The mitochondria, you can see them here in the red. Uh, usually cells have one. They, they can have several. Um, the mitochondria is the basic power system for a cell. And so you can see a close-up of one here. Um, one cool piece that's worth mentioning of just history is the discovery of how mitochondria got to be in animal cells. They're always kind of a mystery because mitochondria actually have their own DNA, which is odd for an organelle. Just like your body has organs, uh, cells have organelles. All these are different types of, of structures that are important to a cell. And they could a lot of them would line up pretty well to what's in your body. The mitochondria is your energy center but it has its own DNA. And it took a scientist called Dr. Lynn Margulis, who also came up with the Gaia theory that the entire earth is one living organism, which is a beautiful theory that she helped to, to populate with her son, Dorian Sagan, who I just interviewed for my show. Um, but she is, she is one of the great thinkers. She was a, a, a synthesizer, Dr. Lynn Margul uh, Margulis. Um, and she completely pioneered, pioneered the idea of endosymbiosis is what she called it. And she figured out that the mitochondria in animal cells and the chloroplasts in plant cells, which is the green things that actually absorb the light from the sun, which is a piece of chemical trickery that is the only thing that makes life, complex life on this planet possible, that both the, these energy sources for the cell, the mitochondria and the chloroplasts were actually bacteria in their own right billions of years ago that got absorbed by a animal cell. And that animal cell realized that they could work together and they formed this endosymbiosis. So, and that just kept going today. The mitochondria still has its own DNA and somewhat does its own thing. All the mitochondria that you have actually comes from your mother because they're very big. It's not going to fit on the sperm cell. And so that's how they can trace lineages much more accurately is through your maternal DNA. That's how we realize that Mother Eve is a black woman in Africa about 40,000 generations ago, I think is the number. Um, but we know that because of the mitochondrial DNA. And I think that's a, a beautiful part of things. The mitochondria, of course, is incredibly important. It's important to all of these different diseases because the mitochondria screwing up screws everything up, especially neurodegenerative disorders. And so in our city as a cell metaphor, the mitochondria would be the eye of London, because I don't know if you've heard this conspiracy theory, but there's a conspiracy theory that the eye of London is actually a power source for the entire city of London, that there's some like hush hush technology going on there, and that the eye of London is what powers all of London. I don't know if that's true, but uh, I love the idea. And as the person who made it up, I think it really has legs to it. So I think you should tell everybody. So we'll consider the eye of London to be the mitochondria for our city. And this is what the mitochondria can do. I know this is a complex slide. Um, you can tell that my books are collage, basically. On the right, that triangle 
is all the things that the, the mitochondria does. It, it's so much and all these different cell types, it makes things happen. It, it gives the energy to build the, the proteins to perform the activities, to regulate all of these important functions like the cells dividing, the cells uh, destroying themselves, the cells recycling bits of themselves. And in all these organs, it does that. Those are important things to control the mitochondria for neurodegenerative diseases, um, insulin for diabetes, and and for processing of energy. And so, this is such an important part of what a cell does. And I like this graphic on the left because it shows you mitochondria on different cell types. On the immune cells, you have the mitochondria um, doing different things, controlling things like uh, respiration, how much uh, energy you're taking in, how much recycling you're doing, autophagy. On the brain cells, it's controlling um, a lot of these different things. And so it's just to sell, show how important the mitochondria are. The thing is, is that the mitochondria actually have cannabinoid receptors on them as well. It's a fascinating fact, and it's one that's not as well studied as some of these other things that we're getting into, but your body's basic energy system is controlled by the cannabinoids. Uh, for instance, this is how it does it. The astroglial cells, the immune cells that I mentioned earlier, I said how they can help coordinate animal behavior. It's not just the neurons themselves. These astroglial uh, cells do it by regulating the amount of lactate available using the mitochondrial uh, receptors on the cells of the astroglial cells, it regulates how much lactate there is. Lactate is basically a building material for the thing, for neurotransmitters and things like that. And so if you simply make less of that, then the neuron is going to do less of what it does. It's a way to calm down a neuron that is not needed or is being overused. And so the astroglial cells use their mitochondrial endocannabinoid receptors to help control overall brain function which I think is a fascinating part of this. And if you have a knockout mouse with no CB1 receptor, then what happens is their memory degrades more rapidly as, as they age. And their hippocampus, the memory area, shows all kinds of negative effects. And so it's not like they don't function if they don't have a CB1 receptor, uh, but they don't function nearly as well if they don't have it. And that's working via the mitochondria. The mitochondria is a really important part of energy. And just to say how that can affect us here, here is a CBD Asian elephant. And if a neuron is the pride of oxygen, which happens in strokes and things like that, the CBD protects it by altering the bioenergetics of the, of the mitochondria. So all of a sudden you're not getting energy anymore. You don't know what to do. The, CB, the CBD elephant goes to the power source, goes to the eye of London and says, calm down, we need to conserve energy. Don't start spinning it all off and, and wasting all these other things. It shifts the entire power flow of the city to save the city while it's in a pandemic or a, or a uh, famine. So when a, when a city's in famine, you need to alter the energy that's going in and you need to, to different, differentiate. You have to change how you allocate resources. And that's what CBD is doing here. And the last one on the mitochondria, just because this is a beautiful part of it, this is virodhamine. Um, so ananda, the anandamide, ananda means is the Sanskrit word for bliss. It's one of the uh, three holy words in the Sanskrit language because the discoverer, one of the discoverers loved Sanskrit. And he thought that calling uh, anandamide the bliss neurotransmitter was a great name. And it is a great name. Virad is opposition. So you could say this, this, is the opposition molecule to anandamide. And so I made that be a finback whale. Um, and I wasn't gonna quote too much from Moby Dick, but I do have to quote this, because you can imagine as I'm reading through Moby Dick, knowing about all these neurotransmitters, and when I heard him describe the finback whale, he said, the finback is not gregarious. He seems a whale hater, as some men are men haters. Very shy, always going solitary, unexpectedly rising to the surface in the remotest and most sullen waters. His straight and single lofty jet rising like a tall misanthropic spear upon a barren plain, gifted with such wondrous power and velocity in swimming as to divide all present pursuit from man. This leviathan seems to banish an unconquerable cane of his race, bearing for his mark that style upon his back. That is absolutely viratamine um, from what we know about it. And so one thing that viratamine does is it helps to regulate 
mega, mega karyocytes. And these are the stem cells in your bones for making platelets. In your blood, platelets are the very smallest type of blood cells. They don't carry oxygen or anything like that. They're responsible for blood clotting. Um, they're small and colorless. And when they find a damaged blood vessel, they just stick to it and they bind there until they form a clot that staunches the bleeding. And you're constantly getting your plate levels re refreshed from these mega karyocytes. These are stem cells for platelets, basically. And so what viratamine does is it helps to regulate this. When your body needs, realizes that you need more pl platelets, it uses viratamine. The, this finback wheel, whale via the CB2 receptors, and it sends signals to the mitochondria to alter their genetics and to set the cell up for the final differentiation into the platelets we need. And so these blue fish would be the MAPK um, just because they're the messenger fish out of this. That's the hard part about studying all of this. The viratamine goes and it activates a CB2 receptor, but that's not what causes the change. It's all of these messengers downstream. And it's just, just constant feedback loop of messengers this, messengers that. And so the, the viratamine, the finback whale goes to the gay bar on the surface of the, of the London eye, sends out some messenger fish, it says, okay, get ready. We're shifting the entire city into platelet mode. And then they do it. And then the mega karyote city is transformed into a nice, smooth, well-behaved platelet city. I love that one. So this is the last part and uh, we're pretty good on time. This is the one that you probably hear about the most, the nucleus, the center of the cell where the DNA is kept. Of course, the nucleus could be seen as the city hall. This is where the blueprints are kept for all the proteins that are going to be built. Everything that gets built in the city is kept in the DNA as the blueprints. And the orders are sent out there, what the city workers should be building, proteins, fatty lipids, nuclear materials. And the nucleus synthesizes all that information coming in from outside the cell, as well as the internal reports about how the cell is doing. And it responds accordingly. And it's a constant ba uh, balance. That's what homeostasis or balance is all about. You need the cell to be constantly responding because sitting still and not reacting means you're dead. Uh, balance is the key. Homeostasis means you're constantly balancing all the things you need to survive and never quite getting to do all of them right all the way. I'm sure that cells wish they exercised more and got more sleep and did their taxes ahead of time, uh, but you have to work and you have to fight off all the bad guys. And you have to maintain the integrity of your membrane and there's just never enough time to do everything perfect, but you still do good enough to get by and you balance out just like every city. Boy, they seem like they're a bunch of jokers and corrupt idiots, but the city survives. That's life. And so how do these cannabinoids do their thing? If you look at endocannabinoid literature, you'll see these two come up a lot. PPAR alpha and PPAR gamma. These are receptors that are on the surface of the nucleus. There aren't cannabinoid receptors on the nucleus, but there are these PPAR receptors and all of our endocannabinoids bind there. There they all are. The main function of these PPAR receptors is to control the cell's metabolism. That's basically the flow of energy how much food you eat, how to handle the waste products. And as you can imagine, it's a hugely important part of a cell's life. Basically, these regulate energy homeostasis and metabolic function. They also have this powerful effect on inflammation as well. So this is why these receptors are such targets for diabetes, cancer, lung disease, obesity, and especially neurodegenerative disorders. Um, and it also affects important processes like uh, differentiation of fat cells, fertility, reproduction, and the transmission of pain signals, which are all things where endocannabinoids play a big role. These receptors could be considered an extension of the endocannabinoid system. Other things bind there, but these are some of the biggest things that do bind there. And notice that at the bottom, you have PEA and oleamide that also bind there. That's why both of them are so good with inflammation and so good with central uh, important effects. Um, by the way, I have, if anybody wants a slideshow of this, I generally have a couple of review articles um, in my notes here, just so I can glance at them as I work. Um, so feel free to email me. I have my email address at the end and you can uh, get the slideshow. I also, I have giant files, uh, 
annotated bibliographies on every organ system and how the endocannabinoid system is involved there. And so if you know anyone who's struggling with disorder or you know doctors who are interested in this stuff and they have specific questions, just feel free to reach out to me. I have big files on this to try to convince people who need convincing or to help medical professionals who are trying to best learn how to harness the endocannabinoid system for human health. And so I'm happy to share that with anybody. Just shoot me a, a line. And so the last part of this, that is just the fun part. How does this work? The PPAR receptors. So you can see we have the CB receptors, the cannabinoid receptors here on the outer membrane of the cell. This is in our city wall. We have the, the, the bars of the whales. And then here at City Hall, we have these PPAR receptors. Uh, I, think, I think it's the city manager's office is a great name for them. The crazy part is we don't know how the cannabinoids bind there. There's four theories, and each of them have some evidence, but they contradict each other. And no one's quite sure what the hell's happening yet. Um, and I think it's a beautiful part of the metaphor of what's going on. There's four guesses as to how the, these uh, PPA receptors are getting uh, activated. One is that it is an intracellular signaling pathway. Basically, a cannabinoid binds to the cannabinoid receptor, and then a messenger goes to the PPAR and activates it. So that could be what's happening. The whale comes to the bar, messenger fish goes to the city, go to the city manager. Pretty straightforward. Um, and I think that happens sometimes. Number two guess is direct binding, which is that the whales and the elephants, because uh, the the CBD and THC bind to some of these as well. They simply pass through the membrane. How they do that, we don't know. Um, could Sometimes we think they pass through, sometimes we think there's a transporter. The presence of a transporter is still a mystery. Um, but that's one guess, is that the, the whales and elephants just go straight to City Hall. This is my favorite guess, uh, fatty acid binding proteins. This is something that has been somewhat well studied. We know that these can help move lipids around the cell, but we don't know if, if they have to be moved this way. It would be called mediated transportation. So maybe these fatty acid binding proteins are something like a vehicle for the whales. And so we don't know if this vehicle is a, a tricycle or if it's a whale car or if it's a little rocket ship, but there are these whale vehicles there and it might be that the whales take a taxi to get to city managers and then pass on their message. And the last guess is conversion to active metabolites. And that would be basically that when a nandamide gets there, it gets chewed up by an enzyme. And some of the pieces of it um, are the things that actually pass on their message. So, you know, it might be that the, the tail of a whale or the trunk of an elephant detached from its body is the only thing that the city managers are looking for. They see that and then they make the changes that are appropriate to perhaps lessen inflammation. Um, so that's a good guess. Because that's the thing, when you cut up these uh, molecules, they don't become inactive. They just become something different. They might, other parts of the body might be reacting to those um, as a signal of what's going on. And so the very last thing I wanna do is just, just walk through this one paper about how all this stuff works. So how science actually works is a fascinating part to me. This is PEA, this is a right whale that we were talking about. And I love this paper because it goes from the biochemical effects all the way up to the actual organism effects, what's actually happening. How PEA causes an antidepressant effect in rats in the hippocampus, the memory area that we keep coming back to. And so just to read through it, PEA is an, an endocannabinoid-like molecule participating in controlling behaviors associated with mental disorders as an endogenous neuroprotective factor. It's something that lives in your brain that protects your brain. On the basis of accumulating evidence in our previous data, we tested the hypothesis that the antidepressant-like effects of PEA observed during chronic, unpredictable, mild stress are mediated by possible targets in the PPAR alpha path pathways. In the study, rats were subjected to 35 days of chronic, unpredictable, mild stress. Um, I think I, they were shocking them, I believe. It's just terrible. There should be a monument in the middle of all of our countries to all the research animals that are focused on that. I mean, biomedical research is important, but I've done my share of this stuff and it is just brutal, the things that get done to these animals so we can learn something about how these whales swim around. So in this study, these rats were shocked for 35 days un unpredictably, which is, you know, stressful. Uh, it's like living with my ex-wife. And they were treated, I don't actually have an ex-wife, and I think my wife's listening. Um, 
and treated with drugs such as PEA or fluoxetine, which is a uh, one of the classic SSRIs, uh, antidepressant medications that gradually make your serotonin go up, or the combination of PEA and MK886, uh, which is a blocker of the PPAR. That's how you really know that uh, that what you're testing is true. Does it still happen when you when you block that receptor? So after these behavioral tests were done, the animals were sacrificed, uh, which is a nice word for it, and their hippocampus, uh, hippocamp eye, were dissected for subsequent studies. So what they found, PEA did, what they were measuring for, it normalized their weight gain, which is a sign of, uh, of more mental balance. Their sucrose preferences, which is another sign of mice being happy when they like a regular amount of sugar and aren't binging on it or eating none of it. Um, locomotor activity in an open field test. Um, generally, rats and mice are scared of lights, and the more that they'll be brave and out in the lights is a test of antidepressant effects. It's not a great test, and there's a lot of pushback against it uh, using that, but it's, it's commonly done. And the level, and they also found that the levels of PPA, alpha, mRNA, and protein in the hippocampus um, were, effect, were normalized, which meant that it, you had regular levels of the blueprints for the PPAR receptor, as well as the regular mount of that receptor. And it reduced serum levels of two important hormones, adrenocorticotropic hormone and corticosterone levels, uh, which are things that spike when you're stressed. So it normalized those. So the all of these to show that PEA was causing these kind of antidepressant-like effects after this uh, sudden shocks. PEA also reversed the abnormal levels of several oxidative stress biomarkers and increased the concentrations of two neurotrophic factors, uh, which is brain growth, brain, brain protection factors in the hippocampus. In addition, PEA alleviated the decrease in hippocampal weight. When you're depressed, your hippocampus actually shrinks. And so uh, PEA saved these mouse's brain, mice's, mice's brains from shrinking. However, the good scientists they were, the aforementioned effects of PEA were completely or partially abolished by MK86, an antagonist. So city manager's office was blocked by this antagonist. And all of a sudden, none of the good effects happened anymore, or they didn't happen nearly as strongly. So if a right whale couldn't get to the city manager's office, the good things didn't happen. The thing about the cannabinoids and most of these is that there's always other ways. It's not usually doing just one thing. It's working via other pathways. And so it's part of what makes this so hard to study. On the basis of these findings, I love this one. The PPR alpha pathway in the hippocampus is a possible target for the antidepressant effects of PEA and the maintenance of a stable hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. That's basically your hormone axis. The antioxidant defenses and normalization of neurotrophic factor levels in the hippocampus are involved in this process. So this is how they, they tested to see how PEA at the biochemical level was causing effects that helped the mice with their stress at the behavioral level. And I think it's a great example of what science is and how it works, except for the sacrificing and electri electrifying of mice. So... This is the cell as a city. Just remember when you think of our cellular city, remember that there's whales everywhere and that they're here to help, mostly. I am Lex Pelger. Uh, congratulations on your interest in the endocannabinoid system. I hope you found it helpful. And the last thing I will offer uh, is that besides the uh, the science uh, bibliographies I mentioned. I also, if you've never listened to Moby Dick, I purposely didn't want to give any of it away um, or read Moby Dick. The best way to do it is to listen to it. I read it twice and then I listened to the audiobook version by this guy, Frank Miller, the great audiobook narrator of uh, The Last Generation. He was a Shakespearean actor, became the great audiobook guy that everybody wanted. He took years to do Moby Dick and the whole thing just rolls over you. It's only like 20 hours long. So now that you might be back to commuting, in just two weeks, you can have, I think, the best book ever written on the American continent um, in your head. And I've and so I would recommend it to anybody. If you're interested in that, just shoot me an email. Uh, my email's there and I'll just shoot, I'll send you the Dropbox of that. So that's it. Oh, the last thing I'll say is I do enjoy teaching about this stuff. If you're a teacher or a college uh, professor or anything like that, I'm always happy to come in and, and teach kids about this stuff. I think it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. I like talking to young people. So I will stop there and have a great night.
Thanks for tuning in. To listen to other episodes, check out pluscbdoil.com or subscribe to the CV Science YouTube channel to see each new episode. And if you'd like to buy any of our fine products at pluscbdoil.com, use the coupon code LEXFILES for 25% off. If you have any questions, compliments, or suggestions, feel free to write me at research at cvsciences.com or send a message on Twitter at The Lex Files Show. If you enjoyed this program, please give us five stars, like us on YouTube, or share a link to your social media. It means a lot to us. I hope keeps bite diapers on the baby's butt, huh? <laughs> the Lex Files audio and video is produced by Matt Payne. The YouTube videos are by Brendan Cleek and Lauren Hines. Thank you to Tina Molnar and Jasmine Morris for the visuals. The music is by Jake Bradford Sharp. Our sponsor is CV Sciences, maker of America's favorite CBD oil. And I'm Lex Pelger, signing off.